Okay, I'm in my backyard today. This didn't turn out exactly how I had planned earlier. I, I went out to uh, the Elkhart River Preserve County Park, an area I'd never been to before, and uh, started filming, and there was just a lot of people there, a lot of interruptions, and so I wasn't really able to do it. So, <laughs> so I'm back here. Um, I'm getting off of the my main storyline that I've been talking on from Genesis. And there's something else that the Lord's leading me to talk about here. Um, we're going to start out in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 7. And this is part of Moses' farewell speech to the children of Israel. And it was all given to him by the Lord, everything that he says here. So, uh, chapter 32 of Deuteronomy, verse 7, starts out, Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Thy elders, and they will tell thee. Isn't that the truth? Uh, we tend to, nowadays, to dismiss what old people say. Or what our parents or grandparents say. It's very wise to take things in consideration that they tell us because they know more than we do they're older than we are and we should take that information and, and do whatever we want to do with it you know maybe it's good advice and maybe it's not but we should still give them that respect to listen when the most high divided to the nations their inheritance when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Now this takes us back a, a bit. When he separated the peoples at the time of the Tower of Babel is, is what this reminds me of here. In verse 9, For the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Now, of course, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. We haven't got to that part yet in, in what I've been reading, but we will probably next week. He found him in a desert land. God. It's talking about God found Jacob in a desert land. And many times in the Bible, Jacob is talked about collectively as being all of those people. Um, this actually goes back to Abraham. Abraham is the one that God singled out from among the sons of Noah. You know, this was hundreds of years after Noah, but there was one man that he singled out, and that was Abram who he renamed Abraham. So, right away in this section here, that's who I think of. It says, He found him in a desert land, and in the waste, howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him. And there was no strange God with him. No, he heard the voice of the living God. Abraham did. Now, even all these people around him were worshiping idols and, and they had, you know, some of them were probably demons that these people worshiped. But even though all that was going on around him, he listened to the voice of the one true God who was speaking to him and was leading him. So that just takes, takes you back to the beginning of God's dealing with man back at that time after the flood and how he chose one man and he raised up a whole nation of people from him. The people that are the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in that line. 
Then in Matthew chapter 23, here we, the Lord Jesus is speaking, and it's at the end of a speech that he's giving. Not really a speech. He's, he's uh, going off on the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he's pronouncing judgment on them. And right toward the end of that, he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under, under her wing, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, Ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now this was fulfilled in several ways. Uh, firstly, it was fulfilled just shortly after this. I think it was like within a week after this happened that he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. They call that the triumphal entry, or we celebrate it on Palm Sunday. And the people that were standing around about when he rode in cried that out, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And uh, so it was fulfilled physically at that time. But there's a, a much later spiritual fulfillment of this that we are yet to see. And that's when he returns again, and his foot sets on the Mount of Olives, <laughs> and then the Mount of Olives will split in two, and it will create a valley. And he'll enter into the eastern gate of the city, which is sealed up right now. Uh, but at that time, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and they will say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So, this is fulfilled, but the way he talked about how often I would have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens, that echoes the, the passage in Deuteronomy, where Moses said, As an eagle stirreth up her nest and fluttereth over her young, spreading abroad her wings and takes them and bears them on her wings, because that's what the eagles do, until the little eaglets learn how to fly. So here, when you hear him speaking, Jesus, when you hear him speaking in this passage in Matthew, um, it's God. You know, it's the Son of God speaking as the Father also. How often I would have gathered thy children together. But they were rebellious. They didn't accept him. Even after all those years and all the great miracles that he'd showed him over thousands of years, actually. Even then. Then in Acts 17, in verse 16, this is the Apostle Paul and in the story here, Luke, or Luke, and <laughs> Luke is writing the story, because Luke was the author of Acts. But he's telling us about it, and Paul is in the city of Athens, Greece. And they go in there on a missionary, on a missionary trip, him and the people that are with him. And the men that are with him have to leave him there because they have to go and help some other brethren of theirs out of trouble in another city. So they leave Paul there. And it starts out in verse 16, Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, he was waiting for his brethren to return, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. They had a lot of gods. In Athens, Greece, uh, they worshipped Zeus and uh, Hercules and Apollo and all that. And the Roman deities were very popular at the same time, which is the same thing, basically. Therefore, disputed he in the synagogue 
with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Okay. So he's having debates with these people around the city of Athens. Then in verse 18, Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, He seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, <laughs> because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. They'd never heard this before. So they, they said, well, you know, what's he babbling about? This strange God that he's talking about. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? They were very curious. It wasn't so much that he was in trouble for saying it or anything. They were just curious what he was talking about. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. There's a lot of literature we have that comes out of uh, ancient Greece. A lot of stuff like, you know, Plato and and all that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of philosophy. But uh, verse 22, Paul answers them. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. <laughs> For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. That's what it said. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I to you. <laughs> so they had an, an altar there that said, to the unknown God. So Paul took that and he used it to his advantage to preach Jesus to him. He goes on in verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. That they should seek the Lord if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and men's device. And the times of this ignorance, God winked at. In other words, he, he overlooked it. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. <laughs> it's probably half and half. You know, some of them just laughed at him and made fun of him, and others said, No, I want to hear more about it. So, right there the ones that laughed they cut themselves off by laughing and making fun of it they cut themselves off from uh, receiving any wisdom from God on this now 
the rest of them were interested and wanted to hear more about it. So they had a uh, they had a soft heart that was able to receive the things of God. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit, certain men clave unto him. That means they, they hung on to him and believed. Among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. That reminds me a lot of the way people are now. A lot of people. There's a lot of people that are always looking. You know, you see them online. You know, they're on there in the different the social media platforms and they're and they're looking for truth. They're researching all these all these different ideas and they're looking for truth in something. But that day it was it was more vague and it was new and the, the gospel was just going out to the world. Now it's readily available everywhere. So people really have no excuse. In the in the present day, people don't have much of an excuse. It's not a matter of not ever hearing about it. It's more a matter of their heart condition, whether they harden their heart or whether they they're open to receive more. Okay, now in Zechariah chapter one, verse three. Therefore thou say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. Now if you notice in this verse, he says, Saith the Lord of hosts, three times. He's really wanting to drive home that this is the Lord of hosts who is saying this. Therefore say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts. There's the first time. Turn ye unto me, saith the Lord of hosts. There's a second time. And I will turn unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. There's the third time. His people had gone so far away from him And he gave them so many chances, time after time after time. Matter of fact, the whole story, the entire Bible is is this story. And it continues on. The Bible is a living book. Because it continued on after Christ. It went through all the Middle Ages, all the different things that happened, clear up until the present day. He's still calling us. In a very simple way, turn to me. In Malachi chapter 3, he says, return to me, and I will return to you. And to this day, he just calls us in this simple way. But yet, so many of us still ignore him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would open our ears up and open our hearts, that we would turn to you, that we would have you and accept you into our lives, into our hearts, and allow you to come in and change us so that we might be able to do your will in the earth. Oh Lord, we know that all things belong to you, and without you, there would be nothing. Everything that we have, everything that we hope to be, and everything that you promised to us, all the great and precious promises that are, that are there, stored up in heaven, waiting for us. Lord, we just thank you. We give you all the glory. I ask that you'd bless everybody within the sound of my voice. Bless my friends. Bless all my enemies and draw them into the kingdom. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. I think that is all I wanted to say. Of course, when I shut the camera off, I always think of all these things. Well, that's not exactly what I wanted to say. What I really wanted to say was this. (laughs) I love you all. And I hope this touched you.
Bye-bye.